Rocket Lab goes big with Neutron, Ship 25's been unexpectedly de-stacked, and Stoke Space is ready to hop. I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF, it's Friday the 15th of September, and there's much more to come this week in spaceflight. Rocket Lab is about to go big with neutron testing, and it's getting more hasty with Electron. This week, the company published pictures of a neutron second stage test article being installed on a structural and cryogenic test stand. Rocket Lab says this test article will be tested through several cryogenic load and pressure cycles to determine its structural and sealing integrity and performance. This is a key milestone for Rocket Lab to test the big composite structures of the neutron rocket and that big upper stage you see there? That's the smallest part of it. The first stage will be even larger. Neutron would effectively become the largest all-composite rocket ever created. Now, it's not easy to do this. I mean, this is precisely one of the many reasons why SpaceX pulled out of making Starship with composites, especially after testing a subscale composite test tank in 2017 and not achieving the expected results. Thankfully, Rocket Lab has more experience with these materials, and hopefully it'll be able to go through the finish line with Neutron. This week, Rocket Lab also confirmed it's been selected to launch four new HASTE missions for Dynetics Mach-TB project. If you remember, HASTE is essentially Rocket Lab's other way of using Electron to perform hypersonic testing. Instead of launching payloads into orbit, it throws payloads that are somewhat heavier into a suborbital trajectory for a hypersonic flight through the atmosphere. There's no doubt that Rocket Lab is going to be busy in the months and years to come. This week, we had quite a bit of news about the European spaceflight sector. One bit of news was the confirmation of the crew of the Axiom 3 mission set to take place in January of next year. This mission will be the first all-European crew, featuring Commander Michael Lopez Alegria, who was born in Spain, pilot Walter Viaday from Italy, mission specialist Alper Gezeravja from Turkey, and Marcus Vant from Sweden. Michael is set to be the first person to command a Crew Dragon spacecraft twice, and Via Day will be the first person to go on two different types of commercial spaceflights, one with Virgin Galactic earlier this year, and this orbital one with SpaceX's Crew Dragon. Gezeravja and Vant will be flying in representation of their own country's space agencies, with Vant also including the involvement of the European Space Agency. Also from Axiom this week, we had the announcement of the award of cargo services for the company's future space station to the Exploration Company. This European private company aims to develop the Nix Cargo Capsule, a small spacecraft that will be capable of delivering cargo to low Earth orbit and also return it back again. Under the agreement between the two companies, the spacecraft would start performing cargo resupply runs to Axiom Space Station in 2027. By this time, the station will still be attached to the International Space Station under Axiom's plans. But the whole story doesn't end here. Next year, the exploration company plans to launch a demonstrator of this capsule named Bikini. But since there aren't a ton of launch options from Europe, the company has had to book a flight on India's PSLV rocket. The original intention was to launch it on an Ariane 6 rocket, but now its debut may not happen until the middle of 2024. The other two European rockets in the market, Vega and Vega C, are also not available anytime soon. This week, Avio, the manufacturer of both Vega rockets, announced that it is not expecting a return to flight of the Vega C rocket anytime soon, mainly due to the need to conduct more test firings to find the cause of the last failure. Also, the regular Vega rocket is booked for the last two remaining flights, so it's pretty understandable that as of right now, no European rocket is available for a flight next year. But the rabbit hole goes even deeper when you take into account all of the new rocket companies that are popping up out of nowhere every few days, and despite Europe's rocket shortage, it definitely looks like in the long run, there's going to be a whole lot more coming from over there. Now let's take a look at this week in launches. This week, Virgin Galactic conducted its third commercial flight with Spaceship Two. Takeoff under the center wing of the VMS Eve took place on September 8th at 1434 UTC from Spaceport America in New Mexico. On board VSS Unity were the pilots Nicola Pachile and Michael Masucci. The passengers for this flight were Ken Baxter, Timothy Nash, and Adrian Reynard, who were accompanied by Virgin Galactic's instructor, Beth Moses. This was the second flight for Pachile and the fifth for Masucci and Moses. After dropping at 1522 UTC and performing an approximately 50-second burn, 
VSS Unity coasted to Apogee and returned back to Earth, successfully landing on Spaceport America's runway at 1534. Virgin Galactic has announced that it intends to perform its next commercial flight next month on October 5th, less than a month after this fourth one. A Falcon 9 took off this week on September 9th at 312 UTC from Space Launch Complex 40 in Florida. The rocket was carrying a batch of 22 Starlink B-2 mini-satellites into low Earth orbit. The first stage for this mission, B-1076, was flying for a seventh time and successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ship A Shortfall of Gravitas. This Chongzheng 6A rocket lifted off on September 10th at 4.30 UTC from Launch Complex 9A at the Taiyan Satellite Launch Center in China. The rocket was carrying three Yaogan-40 satellites into polar orbit. This was the third launch of the Chongzheng 6A rocket, a stretched and more powerful version of the Chongzheng 6 rocket that started launching back in March of 2022. A ULA Atlas V rocket lifted off on September 10th at 1247 UTC from Space Launch Complex 41 in Florida. The rocket was carrying three classified payloads for the National Reconnaissance Office and U.S. Space Force as part of the NROL-107 mission, which is part of the Silent Barker program. While the details of the mission are obviously classified, it is understood that these three payloads may have been inserted near or above geostationary orbit. This is because their main job is to essentially serve as watchdogs that quietly surveil the activities of other countries' satellites in the geostationary orbit belt, hence the name Silent Barker. This was the first launch of Atlas V from the Cape in 11 months, and it was a great opportunity to see the Bruiser, as ULA CEO calls it, flying again. This Falcon 9 launch took place on September 12th at 6.57 UTC from Space Launch Complex 4 East in Vandenberg, California. The rocket was carrying another batch of 21 Starlink V2 mini-satellites into low Earth orbit. The first stage for this mission, B-1071, was flying for an 11th time and successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ship Of Course I Still Love You. With this launch, SpaceX has now put 5,091 satellites in orbit, of which 348 have re-entered and 4,065 are currently in operational orbit. Firefly was finally able to demonstrate its rapid launch capabilities with the third launch of its Alpha rocket and the Victus Knox mission. Liftoff took place on September 15th at 2.27 UTC from Space Launch Complex 2 West in Vandenberg, California. The rocket was carrying the Victus Knox technology demonstration satellite for the U.S. Space Force as part of the Tactically Responsive Launch Program, or TACRS. The mission intends to demonstrate the ability of commercial companies to both deliver and launch a satellite in a short time frame. In this case, the delivery was made by Millennium Space, which had to be done in under 60 hours from the call to action to handover, and the launch was performed by Firefly Aerospace, which had to be done in under 24 hours from receiving the call for launch to liftoff. The mission was carried out successfully, and both companies have now demonstrated this crucial capability for the U.S. government. SpaceX has de-stacked Ship 25 from Booster 9 at Starbase, but is that good or bad? The answer depends on your expectations. A de-stack of Ship 25 from Booster 9 was expected to happen in advance of the second flight of Starship, after all, teams need to configure the flight termination system on Ship 25 prior to launch, and that requires destacking the vehicle as there's no lift that can reach up that high. But if that's the case, then we would expect a launch coming up soon, right? There are a number of ways for us at NSF to find out whether a launch is coming up soon or not. Anything from notice to mariners, airspace closures, and many other things that Das actually covered in a recent video. You might want to check it out for a full rundown of all of that. The issue is that there isn't exactly a closure or a hazard warning of any kind that points to a flight soon. So is this bad then? Well, not so fast. This week we had a comment from the FAA's acting administrator, Polly Trottenberg, explaining the process to modify Starship's launch license for the second launch could be finished sometime in the next month. This would explain why we're not seeing those signs of a launch coming up soon as it's still a few weeks away. In addition to these comments, SpaceX's Kathy Leaders said this week that the company had de-stacked Ship 25 not only to perform work on its flight termination system, but also to proceed with other vehicle checkouts in the next few days and weeks as it prepares for flight. So that's basically the whole story. Not good, not bad. Just doing the work, getting through the last few checks, getting that flight termination system done on the two stages, and maybe, in her words, in two or three weeks, we could see everything ready for launch. So don't worry, the launch is coming up, it'll just be a little bit longer. 
If you want to stay updated with whatever goes on at Starbase, you can bet we'll be covering it here on our channel in one way or another. Now let's take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space. NASA has begun the installation of the RS-25 engines for the Artemis II SLS core stage. This engine installation was planned to take place earlier this year, but other issues with the stage delayed this operation for several months until now. Delivery of this core stage is now not expected until November or December, but thankfully it's not going to be needed until spring of next year, so there's plenty of margin left on the schedule. Telesat announced this week that it's purchased 14 Falcon 9 launches from SpaceX to launch its next-generation low-Earth orbit satellite constellation, the Telesat Lightspeed. The company touted Falcon 9 rocket as, quote, the most reliable and only reusable orbital rocket flying today, saying that the demonstrated quick cadence of the rocket is what has driven the company to choose it to launch so many missions. The launches would begin in 2026 and carry up to 18 satellites each for a total of up to 252 satellites in total. ULA's first flight, Centaur 5, has now passed proof testing and it's being readied for shipment. Part of that readiness process involves applying a spray-on foam insulator, or SOFI, that will insulate the cryogenic tanks during Centaur's stay on the pad and in orbit. This process also involves attaching other systems like batteries, pressure systems, reaction control thrusters, and more. The stage is set to be shipped in November, with ULA hoping to launch Vulcan's first mission in the middle of December. SES is joining forces with Starlink to deliver high-speed, low-latency internet to the cruise industry. Under this offer, the company would add Starlink to its O3B M-Power internet constellation to provide more resilience and global connectivity with zero to no dropouts. You know what they say, if you can't beat them, join them. Stokes Hopper 2 prototype has performed its pre-flight static fire and it's ready to hop. The company is very optimistic about the outcome of this fiery test and it's preparing everything to let this hydrogen kettle fly for the first time. Yes, hydrogen kettle, come on, don't look at me like that. If Starhopper was a water tower, this is clearly a hydrogen kettle. I mean, look, it has its own vent on the side with burning hydrogen. This week, Jared Isaacman, founder of the Polaris program, confirmed on Twitter that the Polaris Dawn mission is being delayed into next year. One of the main reasons for that, he says, is the development of the EVA suits needed for the planned spacewalk during that mission. This mission had originally been scheduled for November of 2022, and its space delays every few months due to this. We'll have to see when this mission finally takes off. This week, NASA released a report from an independent study team on Unidentified Anomalous Phenomena, or UAPs, and as a result of it, it decided to appoint a director of UAP research. The report, which is about 36 pages long, talks, in essence, about the need to thoroughly understand more about these phenomena and collect more data about them, not only looking through new data, but also through prior data using modern technology such as AI and machine learning to bring up the important pieces of information needed to validate these observations. In light of this report, NASA has appointed Mark McInerney as the director of UAP research at the agency. With this, the agency hopes to shed more light into this matter from a more scientific perspective, rather than, you know, being like the guy on the History Channel that's immediately like, aliens. P.S. It's most definitely not aliens. And now, let's go over next week in spaceflight. We'll cover this one in detail next week, but we're just a few hours away from the launch of the Soyuz MS-24 crewed mission out of Baikonur, so come back next week for the full rundown of that. A Changzheng 2D rocket is set to launch next week on September 17th at 4.15 UTC from the Xichang Satellite Launch Center, carrying a yet unknown payload. A Falcon 9 rocket is set to launch next week from Florida, carrying another batch of Starlink satellites. The launch is set to take place with a four-hour window that opens at approximately 2 o'clock UTC. Rocket Lab is gearing up for its next electron launch out of New Zealand with the We Will Never Desert You mission. Launch is currently scheduled to occur on September 19th, but a window has not yet been made public. And that's your weekly update of spaceflight news! We'll see you all again next week to recap this week in spaceflight.